Judge Daniel Carter had built his career on fairness and justice. As he left the courthouse that afternoon, the sun was bright, and he felt a sense of calm after a long day of hearings. Dressed in a sharp suit with his briefcase in hand, Daniel planned to stop at a local grocery store on his way home, a routine task that, today, would change his life in unexpected ways. As he drove through the quiet suburban neighborhood, Daniel couldn't help but notice the contrast between the courthouse and this peaceful, predominantly white community. Though he had walked into countless rooms where he felt out of place, he was a judge, respected by his peers, and had learned to brush off any feelings of unease. When he pulled into the store parking lot, Daniel felt the same tension he always did in unfamiliar spaces, but it wasn't enough to unsettle him. He parked, adjusted his tie, and stepped out of his car, reminding himself that he had nothing to worry about. After all, he was a man of the law, and surely no one could question his integrity. Daniel entered the small grocery store, immediately sensing something different about the atmosphere. The store wasn't crowded, but the few people inside seemed to take notice of him. The cashier, a young white woman, glanced up and quickly looked away, as if she didn't want to acknowledge his presence. It wasn't the first time Daniel had felt this way, but today it hit harder. As he moved through the aisles, picking up a few essentials, Daniel noticed whispers from a couple near the register. He caught a snippet of their conversation. Who is he? I haven't seen him around before. It was a small town, and strangers didn't go unnoticed. But what bothered Daniel wasn't the curiosity, it was the suspicion in their voices. Daniel continued shopping, ignoring the looks and quiet murmurs. He was used to this. After all, being one of the few black judges in the region meant he was often the subject of scrutiny. But as he made his way toward the checkout, a sense of unease settled over him. Something about today felt different. Just as Daniel was about to approach the counter to pay for his items, the bell above the door chimed loudly, signaling the arrival of someone new. He glanced up only to see a large, imposing man in a police uniform stride in with a confident, almost arrogant air. Officer Rick Matthews, a white officer known for his heavy-handed approach, scanned the store as if looking for someone specific. Daniel watched from the corner of his eye as Officer Matthews headed straight for him. His heart sank slightly. He had seen this before. The slow approach, the subtle flexing of authority, the cold stare. Matthews had a reputation for being rough, especially with people of color, and today Daniel seemed to be his target. Excuse me, sir, Matthews said, his voice gruff and authoritative. We've had some reports of a suspicious person fitting your description. I'm going to need to ask you a few questions. The accusation was immediate, and Daniel felt the eyes of the store's patrons fix on him. His breath quickened, but he kept his composure. He knew how to handle this. At least he thought he did. Daniel raised an eyebrow, surprised by the officer's sudden approach. Excuse me? What seems to be the problem, officer? He asked, maintaining a calm tone. He had done nothing wrong and had no reason to be concerned, other than the fact that he fit a description. It wasn't the first time he'd been profiled, but the blatant nature of it still caught him off guard. Officer Matthews stepped closer, his eyes narrowing as he looked Daniel up and down. We've had reports of a man matching your description involved in a robbery nearby. Dark skin, tall, wearing a suit. You fit the bill? His voice was cold and accusatory, as if the mere fact that Daniel was black made him guilty by association. Daniel felt a surge of anger rise in his chest but forced himself to remain composed. Officer, I'm a judge. Judge Daniel Carter. I've just finished my work at the courthouse and came here to grab a few things before heading home. You can check my ID if you'd like. He pulled out his wallet, offering his ID to the officer, but Matthews didn't even glance at it. The situation was quickly escalating. Matthews ignored Daniel's ID, his face hardening with arrogance. A judge, huh? He said, his tone dripping with disbelief. We'll see about that. In the meantime, I need you to come with me outside. We'll clear this up back at the station. His voice was full of authority, but Daniel could see through the facade. This was about power, not procedure. Daniel felt his pulse quicken, but he kept his voice steady. I've done nothing wrong, Officer Matthews. I won't be stepping outside with you unless you have a legitimate reason to detain me. If you want to verify my identity, feel free to call the courthouse. 
but I will not be treated like a criminal without cause. Matthew sneered, clearly not used to being challenged, especially by someone like Daniel. You think you can talk your way out of this? You're acting suspicious, and that's enough for me. Now you can come quietly, or I'll have to make you. The threat hung in the air, and Daniel knew he was in a dangerous position. The officer's power was real, and it was clear he was willing to abuse it. Without another word, Matthews grabbed Daniel by the arm, twisting it behind his back with unnecessary force. Daniel winced as the officer slapped handcuffs onto his wrists, the cold metal biting into his skin. You're under arrest for suspicion of robbery, Matthew said loudly, making sure everyone in the store heard. The humiliation was immediate and suffocating. Daniel's mind raced. He could feel the judgment in the eyes of the onlookers, some staring in shock, others with thinly veiled satisfaction. Here he was, a respected judge, being arrested in public as if he were a common criminal. This is a mistake, Daniel said through clenched teeth. You'll regret this, Officer Matthews. But Matthews wasn't listening. He pushed Daniel toward the door, his grip firm and aggressive. We'll see who regrets this, Matthews muttered under his breath, clearly enjoying the power he held in this moment. The store fell silent as Daniel was marched outside, and the weight of the injustice pressed down on him with every step. As Matthews led Daniel out of the store in handcuffs, people from nearby shops and passers-by began to gather. The sight of a black man being arrested by a white cop was enough to draw attention in this small town, and soon phones were out, recording the spectacle. Daniel could hear the murmurs of the growing crowd, some whispering in disbelief, others in quiet approval. The humiliation was almost unbearable. Daniel had spent his life upholding the law, but now he found himself on the other side, treated as if his entire career and reputation meant nothing. His mind raced, thinking of how quickly this could escalate. He had always known that being black in America came with challenges, but this, being wrongfully arrested in broad daylight, was a new level of degradation. As Matthews shoved Daniel into the back of the patrol car, he could feel his anger boiling over. This isn't over, officer. You're making a mistake, Daniel said, his voice steady but laced with fury. Matthews only smirked, slamming the car door shut. We'll see about that, the officer said, walking around to the driver's side. The patrol car sped off, leaving a crowd of onlookers behind. Inside the patrol car, Daniel sat in silence, his hands cuffed behind his back. His wrists ached from the tightness of the cuffs, but the pain was nothing compared to the frustration and anger simmering inside him. How could this happen? How could a man who had dedicated his life to justice be treated so unjustly. He had seen countless cases of police misconduct, but never had he imagined he would be the victim. Matthews drove in silence, his smug expression visible in the rearview mirror. The officer's arrogance was infuriating. He clearly believed that he had done nothing wrong, that detaining Daniel was just another routine arrest. But Daniel knew better. This wasn't about enforcing the law. This was about power, about putting a black man in his place. As they approached the station, Daniel took a deep breath, reminding himself of who he was and what he stood for. This might be the most humiliating moment of his life, but it wasn't over. He would fight this. He had no choice. His career, his reputation, and his dignity were on the line. Matthews would learn that he had arrested the wrong man. When they arrived at the station, Matthews roughly pulled Daniel from the back of the car, his grip firm on Daniel's arm. Daniel, despite his anger, remained composed. He wasn't going to give Matthews the satisfaction of seeing him rattled. As they entered the station, the atmosphere shifted. The officers inside looked up, some with surprise, others with curiosity. Got a suspect here involved in a robbery, Matthews said loudly as he walked Daniel toward the booking desk. The other officers exchanged glances but didn't question Matthews' authority. Daniel could feel the eyes on him, judgmental, curious, but none sympathetic. It was clear that the assumption had already been made, guilty until proven innocent. Daniel stood tall, despite the humiliation of being paraded through the station in handcuffs. He met the gaze of the officers watching him, daring them to question what was happening. But no one did. He was led into a holding room, where Matthews finally removed the handcuffs, though his grip on Daniel's wrist remained unnecessarily firm. Sit tight, 
Matthew said coldly before leaving the room. Daniel sat in the cold, sterile holding room, his mind racing. How had things escalated so quickly? One moment, he had been a respected judge, and the next, he was sitting in a police station, treated like a criminal. He knew he needed to take control of the situation, but how? This was a small town, and it was clear that Matthews held influence here. After a few minutes, a younger officer entered the room, his face filled with uncertainty. He glanced at Daniel, clearly unsure of how to handle the situation. Sir, can I get your information? The officer asked quietly, avoiding eye contact. Daniel took a deep breath and nodded, giving the officer his details. He knew that this young man likely didn't want to be involved in this mess, but he was part of the system nonetheless. As the officer typed in Daniel's information, Daniel spoke calmly. You do realize who I am, don't you? I'm Judge Carter. I was just doing my job, and Officer Matthews has made a grave mistake here. I expect this to be cleared up quickly. The young officer swallowed nervously. I'll check your records, sir. Just please wait here. He hurried out of the room, leaving Daniel alone once again. As Daniel sat in the holding room, the door suddenly opened, and in walked someone he recognized. Ethan, a defense attorney and an old colleague. Ethan's face was a mix of surprise and anger as he took in the sight of Daniel sitting in the holding room. What the hell is going on here? Ethan asked, his voice filled with frustration. Daniel stood up, relieved to see a friendly face. Matthews arrested me on suspicion of robbery. He refused to check my ID, refused to listen to me. This is a mess, Ethan. Ethan's face darkened as he listened. That's ridiculous. You've been a judge in this state for years. This is clearly profiling, plain and simple. Ethan didn't waste any time. Don't worry, I'll get you out of here. This is a gross abuse of power, and I'm not going to let them get away with it. He turned on his heel and stormed out of the room, ready to confront Matthews and anyone else involved. Daniel felt a small sense of relief. He wasn't alone in this fight, but he knew that this was far from over. Ethan marched straight toward Matthews, his face set in a determined scowl. You've made a serious mistake, Officer Matthews, Ethan said, his voice low but filled with authority. Do you even know who you've arrested? Judge Daniel Carter. He's not some random guy off the street. He's a respected member of the judiciary, and you've just humiliated him in front of half the town. Matthews leaned back against the desk unimpressed. Judge or not, he was acting suspicious, and I had every right to detain him. I don't care who he is. His voice dripped with arrogance. Ethan clenched his fists, struggling to keep his temper in check. This is profiling, plain and simple. You ignored his ID, you ignored his explanation, and you arrested him without cause. Matthew smirked, clearly enjoying the power he held. Like I said, we'll see what the higher-ups have to say about it. Until then, he stays here. Ethan glared at Matthews knowing that this was more than just a misunderstanding. This was a deliberate attempt to assert dominance over a black man in power. You'll regret this, Ethan said, his voice firm. I guarantee it. Back in the holding room, Daniel's frustration was growing by the minute. He had always believed in the system, but now he was witnessing its failures firsthand. His phone had been confiscated when he was brought in, but he knew there was one person who could help him now, Sarah Henderson a prominent civil rights attorney and a close friend. After what felt like an eternity, Ethan returned, his face still filled with anger. This is going to take a little longer than I hoped, he said, pacing the room. Matthews is digging in his heels. But don't worry, I've already called Sarah. She's on her way. Daniel nodded, relieved that Sarah was getting involved. She was a force to be reckoned with, and if anyone could turn this situation around, it was her. Ethan continued to pace. This is going to blow up, Daniel. The media will be all over this once they find out a sitting judge was arrested without cause. Matthews won't be able to hide behind his badge for long. Daniel nodded again, though his anger still simmered beneath the surface. He had never wanted this kind of attention, but now that it was here, he knew he had to fight. When Sarah Henderson arrived at the police station, her presence was immediately felt. She marched in with the confidence of someone who had spent her entire career fighting against injustice. Her sharp eyes quickly scanned the room, landing on Matthews, who was still leaning against the desk with a smug grin. 
Without hesitation, she approached him, her voice cutting through the tension. Officer Matthews, I'm Sarah Henderson, Judge Carter's attorney. You've made a serious mistake, and I'm here to fix it, she said, her tone icy. Matthews straightened up, his smirk faltering slightly. This is none of your concern, Ms. Henderson. Your client is being held on suspicion of robbery, and we're handling it. Sarah's eyes narrowed. You're not handling anything. You're violating the rights of a sitting judge, and if you don't release him immediately, you're going to be facing a lawsuit that will destroy your career. Her voice was calm, but there was no mistaking the threat behind her words. Matthews hesitated, clearly unnerved by Sarah's presence. We're still investigating, he started, but Sarah cut him off. There's nothing to investigate. You've arrested an innocent man based on a bogus description, and I'm giving you one chance to correct this mistake before it becomes much bigger than you can handle. Inside the holding room, Daniel heard raised voices outside, recognizing Sarah's authoritative tone. He couldn't hear every word, but he knew she was fighting for him. It was a strange feeling. Daniel was used to being the one delivering justice, but now he found himself relying on others to protect his rights. The irony wasn't lost on him. Ethan, still pacing, glanced at Daniel. Sarah's got this. Don't worry. She'll get you out of here. Daniel nodded, though the knot of frustration in his chest refused to ease. It's just... I've spent my life believing in the system, Ethan, and now I'm sitting here treated like a criminal. It's infuriating. Ethan stopped pacing and placed a reassuring hand on Daniel's shoulder. I know, man, but this isn't about the law. It's about power. Matthew sees you as a threat, not because of anything you've done, but because of who you are. And people like him, they can't stand seeing someone like you in a position of authority. Daniel sighed, knowing Ethan was right. Well, he's going to learn that I'm not going down without a fight. Back at the front desk, Sarah was still going head to head with Matthews. You've got about five seconds to decide if you want to spend the rest of your career fighting a wrongful arrest lawsuit, she said, her voice steady and cold. Matthews was visibly irritated, his confidence waning in the face of Sarah's relentless pressure. This isn't over, Matthews finally muttered, pulling a set of keys from his belt. But fine, I'll release him. For now. He unlocked the door to the holding room, his face tight with frustration. Sarah followed him inside, her expression softening slightly as she saw Daniel sitting there, still composed despite everything. Daniel, she said, her voice calmer now. Let's get you out of here. Matthews uncuffed Daniel without a word, though his movements were rough, clearly trying to salvage whatever power he could. Daniel stood, rubbing his wrists and glanced at Sarah with a nod of appreciation. Thank you, he said quietly, though his eyes still burned with anger. As Daniel, Sarah, and Ethan walked out of the station, they were greeted by a small crowd gathered outside. News of Daniel's arrest had spread quickly, and people were eager to see what would happen next. Some had their phones out, recording the scene, while others stood in silence waiting for someone to speak. Daniel stopped on the steps of the station, turning to face the crowd. He knew this moment was bigger than him now. This was about exposing the injustice that had just occurred, not only for himself, but for every person who had ever been wrongfully targeted. This is not just about me, he began, his voice steady but filled with emotion. This is about a system that continues to allow injustice to thrive. The crowd listened intently as Daniel spoke. I was arrested today for fitting a description. No evidence, no probable cause, just a description based on my skin color. This isn't just a mistake. This is systemic racism, and it needs to be addressed. I'm not going to let this go. We're going to fight this, and we're going to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. The video of Daniel's statement spread quickly online, gaining traction on social media within hours. People were outraged that a judge, someone who was supposed to represent the law, had been wrongfully arrested in such a public and humiliating manner. News outlets began calling, eager to cover the story and shine a light on the incident. Sarah, always the strategist, knew this was an opportunity to bring national attention to the issue of racial profiling and police misconduct. She set up interviews with major news networks, ensuring that Daniel's story would reach a wide audience. This is bigger than just a local issue, she told him. We need to make sure people across the country understand what's happening. 
Daniel agreed, though the thought of becoming the center of a media storm was daunting. He had spent his life serving the law, staying out of the spotlight, but now he realized that he had a responsibility to use his platform to push for change. If my arrest can spark a conversation about systemic racism, then it's worth it, he said, though the weight of the situation hung heavy on his shoulders. Back in the small town, reactions to Daniel's arrest were mixed. Some residents were horrified by what had happened, expressing support for Daniel and demanding accountability from the police department. Others, however, sided with Matthews, believing that the officer had simply been doing his job and that Daniel's arrest was justified. Conversations about race and policing dominated the local coffee shops and grocery stores. Longtime residents debated whether the town had a problem with racism, with some insisting that Matthews had acted out of caution, not malice. But for many, the arrest was a wake-up call, a reminder that even in a seemingly quiet town, issues of race and power were still very much alive. Daniel could feel the tension in the air as he walked through town in the days following his release. Some people avoided eye contact, while others offered words of support. It was clear that his case had divided the community, and Daniel knew that the battle ahead would be just as much about changing hearts and minds as it would be about changing laws. With Sarah's guidance, Daniel filed a formal complaint against Officer Matthews, citing racial profiling, wrongful arrest, and misconduct. The complaint detailed the events of that afternoon, laying out the officer's failure to verify Daniel's identity and his blatant disregard for Daniel's rights. It was a strong case, and Sarah was confident they had a solid chance of winning. As they prepared to take the case to court, Sarah warned Daniel that the road ahead would be difficult. This isn't just about you, she reminded him. This is about challenging an entire system. There will be pushback, and it's going to get ugly. But we have to be ready for that. Daniel nodded, fully aware of the challenges they would face. I'm ready he said, his voice steady. I've spent my life fighting for justice, and I'm not going to back down now. But even as he said the words, he knew that this fight would test him in ways he had never imagined. As news of the complaint spread, the town became even more divided. Protests were organized in support of Daniel, with residents demanding accountability from the police department and calling for Matthews to be suspended. Signs reading, Justice for Judge Carter, and End Racial Profiling, appeared in front yards and storefronts as more people began to speak out. At the same time, a counter-movement began to form, with some residents defending Matthews and accusing Daniel of overreacting. He was just doing his job, they argued. Why should the town be torn apart over this? Tensions rose as these opposing groups clashed, both online and in person, with heated debates about race, policing, and justice. Daniel watched the division unfold with a heavy heart. He had always believed that the law could bring people together, but now it seemed to be driving them apart. Yet despite the growing hostility, he knew that this was a fight worth having. Change was never easy, and the fact that people were talking about these issues at all was a step in the right direction. Months later, the day of the trial finally arrived. The courtroom was packed with spectators, journalists, and supporters on both sides. Daniel sat at the front of the courtroom with Sarah by his side, his face calm but determined. This was the moment he had been waiting for, the chance to hold Matthews accountable for his actions and to expose the deep-rooted problems within the system. As the proceedings began, Sarah delivered a powerful opening statement, laying out the facts of the case and emphasizing the systemic racism that had led to Daniel's wrongful arrest. This isn't just about one officer making a mistake, she said. This is about a system that allows officers like Matthews to act with impunity, targeting people based on the color of their skin. The defense tried to paint a different picture, arguing that Matthews had acted within his rights and that Daniel had been uncooperative during the arrest. But as witness after witness testified, it became clear that Matthews had overstepped his authority and the weight of the evidence was undeniable. The trial was not just about justice for Daniel, it was about challenging the entire system. During the trial, Matthews' defense team did everything they could to discredit Daniel. They argued that Matthews had acted on a credible report of a robbery and that Daniel's behavior during the arrest had been suspicious. Officer Matthews was simply doing his job, the defense attorney argued, 
He followed procedure, and any reasonable officer would have acted the same way. But Sarah was relentless in her cross-examinations, pointing out the many ways in which Matthews had ignored protocol and violated Daniel's rights. She presented evidence that Matthews had a history of targeting black men in the community, and she called witnesses who testified to similar incidents of racial profiling. The defense tried to counter these claims, but the damage was done. Matthews' pattern of behavior was clear, and it was becoming increasingly difficult for the jury to ignore. As the trial progressed, it became evident that this case was about more than just Daniel's arrest. It was about exposing a broken system that had been allowed to operate unchecked for far too long. After days of testimony and legal arguments, the trial finally reached its conclusion. The jury deliberated for hours, the tension in the courtroom palpable as everyone awaited the verdict. Daniel sat quietly, his hands folded in his lap, his face calm despite the whirlwind of emotions swirling inside him. This was the moment he had been fighting for. When the jury returned, the room fell silent. The foreman stood and cleared his throat before reading the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Officer Richard Matthews, guilty of racial profiling and misconduct. A collective sigh of relief swept through the courtroom as Daniel closed his eyes for a moment, feeling the weight of the decision settle over him. Sarah smiled at him, her eyes shining with pride. We did it, she whispered. Daniel nodded, though he knew this was just the beginning. The verdict was a victory, but the fight to reform the system was far from over. Still, for the first time in months, Daniel felt a sense of peace. Justice had been served, and Matthews would face the consequences of his actions. The aftermath of the trial was felt throughout the town. For some, the verdict was a triumph, a sign that the system could work and that justice could be achieved. For others, it was a bitter pill to swallow. Matthews had his supporters, and they were vocal in their displeasure, claiming that he had been unfairly targeted and that the trial had been politically motivated. Protests erupted on both sides, with tensions running high as the town grappled with the outcome. Daniel tried to stay out of the fray, knowing that his involvement would only escalate the situation. But he couldn't help but feel a sense of responsibility for the division that had taken root in the community. He had fought for justice, but the cost had been higher than he anticipated. Despite the unrest, Daniel remained committed to the cause. He knew that real change would take time, and he was determined to be part of that process. The trial was over, but the work of rebuilding trust and reforming the system had only just begun. In the weeks following the trial, Daniel became a leading voice in the push for police reform in the town. He spoke at community meetings, calling for greater accountability and transparency within the police department. His message was clear, the system needed to change, and it was up to the community to demand that change. Not everyone was receptive to his message. There were those who saw Daniel as a troublemaker, someone who had brought unwanted attention to the town, but there were also many who stood by him, recognizing that the trial had exposed a deeper problem that could no longer be ignored. Daniel knew that the road ahead would be long and difficult, but he was ready. He had spent his life fighting for justice, and he wasn't going to stop now. The trial had given him a platform, and he intended to use it to push for the changes that were so desperately needed. As the dust from the trial settled, the town's police department found itself under intense scrutiny. An internal investigation was launched to address the systemic issues that had been brought to light during the trial. Officers were questioned, protocols were reviewed, and the department was forced to confront its own shortcomings. For many within the department, the investigation was a wake-up call. Officers, who had previously turned a blind eye to Matthew's behavior, were now being held accountable for their silence. There was a growing recognition that things had to change if the department was to regain the trust of the community. Daniel watched these developments with cautious optimism. He knew that real reform would take time, but the fact that the department was finally being forced to address its problems was a step in the right direction. The trial had shaken the town to its core, and now there was hope that something better could emerge from the ashes. Despite the progress being made within the police department, the town remained deeply divided. Protests continued, with both sides refusing to back down. Those who supported Daniel and the push for reform clashed with those who believed that the town had been unfairly targeted by outside forces. 
Daniel tried to bridge the divide, reaching out to both sides in an attempt to foster dialogue and understanding, but it wasn't easy. The wounds in the community ran deep, and there were those who were determined to resist any change. For many, the trial had only confirmed their fears about the changing face of their town. Still, Daniel refused to give up. He knew that change was never easy and that it often came with resistance. But he believed in the power of the law and in the ability of people to come together for the greater good. He had seen it happen before, and he was determined to see it happen again. Months after the trial, the town was still grappling with the fallout, but there were signs of hope. The police department had implemented new training programs aimed at addressing issues of racial bias and improving relations with the community. A civilian oversight board had been established to ensure greater accountability and transparency in law enforcement. Daniel continued to play a key role in these efforts, working closely with community leaders and activists to push for lasting change. He knew that the road ahead would be long, but he was committed to seeing it through. The trial had been a turning point, but it was only the beginning of a much larger movement. As he walked through the town one afternoon, Daniel couldn't help but feel a sense of pride. Despite the challenges, despite the resistance, progress was being made. And while there was still much work to be done, he knew that the fight for justice was worth it. As the town of Grafton slowly began to heal, Daniel reflected on the journey that had brought him here. He had never wanted to be the center of a controversy, but fate had placed him in this position and he had risen to the challenge. The trial had exposed the deep-rooted problems within the system, and now there was a chance to fix them. But Daniel knew that the work was far from over. The battle for justice was ongoing, and there would always be those who resisted change. Still, he was ready. He had spent his life fighting for what was right, and he wasn't going to stop now. As he stood on the steps of the courthouse looking out over the town, Daniel felt a sense of hope. The road ahead would be long and difficult, but he was prepared to walk it. And with the support of people like Sarah, Ethan, and the many others who had stood by him, he knew that they could make a difference, one step at a time.